And again, we're, we're titling it Capturing Valuable Nutrients from Manure. And uh, this will be done this month, next month, and then January. I would like to point out that for the December webcast, we will be holding it one week earlier than normal. Usually we have our webcast the third week of the month or third Friday, but that's the Friday before uh, the Christmas holiday. So this next month we will be having the webcast on December 13th. So what are the five top reasons to capture nutrients? Um, and as I've thought about this um, and bring a perspective as a nutritionist, I think one of the things that's really clear is that less than half of the nutrients that we feed our animals or that are consumed by our animals are actually captured in that final product of uh, meat, milk, and eggs. And so that leaves us with uh, a fair amount of nutrients that are there in the uh, manure that we need to manage in a way that uh, is captured as much as possible by the crop growth and we minimize losses to the environment. Um, we do know that um, in recent years, we've seen quite a spike in the, the cost of uh, commercial fertilizers. And I'll actually show you a slide of uh, the cost of phosphorus fertilizers here in a moment. Um, and uh, across the U.S., uh, we've seen evidence of nutrient-impaired surface and groundwater. And while not of all of this is, um, can be associated with animal ag, certainly um, animal agriculture has its uh, contribution towards impairment of, of surface and groundwaters in certain areas. The ones that I think we most often hear about in recent times are the Chesapeake Bay Area, Bay Area. and now we're also seeing uh, information about uh, what are called dead zones in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico and uh, contributions down through the whole Mississippi uh, watershed. So, and then the fifth area would be uh, or excuse me, the fourth one here would be that we do have some nutrients, in particular phosphorus, that have been projected to have a limited supply. And uh, Paul Fexon will be talking about this in greater t detail, particularly from a, uh, a global perspective. So bringing it back to the actual cow level, um, and uh, again, giving a little bit of a nutrition perspective on this, if we look at nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we see that in the case of uh, the cow, that uh, we can actually capture about 30% of the nitrogen the cow consumes, and this goes to about 30 to 35% uh, with very well-balanced diets, high-producing cows. And so that leaves about uh, 65 to 75% of the nitrogen that that cow eats is going to go out in the, in the manure. With regard to phosphorus, um, we're capturing about 27% of the phosphorus that the cow eats. goes in the milk carton and then is... Uh, transported off farm. And then with potassium, we're at about 13%. So again, you can see that uh, certainly less than half of the nutrients for the dairy cow are captured in these initial uh, available products, uh, being milk in this case. If we expand that kind of uh, information from a cow to a county level, this map shows information that was developed by our Economic Research Service uh, through USDA a number of years ago in a publication that they put out, and they did it county by county. And this particular map shows the relationship between the amount of manure that would be projected to be, or the amount of phosphorus that would project to be manure with um, the, uh, the crops that were grown in that particular county and the amount of phosphorus used by those crops. So any of the, the cells that are darker, and particularly once they get into the red and the blues, you can see that those are uh, counties in particular where there is more phosphorus available in the manure than is actually used by, by the, or the crops. And so those counties would be projected to have excesses of, of phosphorus in the soil. So, um, so we can take this kind of back to the, the farm level. Uh, are our nutrients inputs and outputs in balance? And what we've seen, uh, and again, I'll use a dairy example, is we've seen um, an increase in uh, the number of cows per farm um, and not necessarily an increase in land base. Uh, what we see is we've got 
in the case of this pond, farm pond example, we've got a gallon coming in and we've got a gallon coming out. And you'll see that the pipe that's going out isn't necessarily meant to be a, uh, a direct access to um, a river or a ditch or a stream, but it's, it's meant to represent that we always do have some loss of nutrients from the farm. It's just inevitable. We want to minimize this loss, but there is uh, some loss that does occur. And as we've increased the number of cows per farm, we increase the import of nutrients to feed those animals, and that results uh, in an increase in, in the level of, of nutrients in the soil. So we begin to fill up this pond, or we begin to fill up the, the ability of that soil to hang on to nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, over the decades, we continue to increase that farm pond. We get to a point where the soil is not able to hold on to all the nutrients with its binding sites, and we begin to lose some of this as, um, as nutrients off to the environment. So through the years, what we've done is we've come up with some temporary solutions. We put in practices on the farm. Uh, many of those uh, practices are, are ones that are recommended through our Natural Resource Conservation Service and to help us keep those nutrients on the farm. But in many ways, they are temporary solutions, and what we need to do is, as a, an industry, get back to looking at ways to capture these nutrients so that um, we can export these nutrients off farm to points in the, um, the farming landscape where they do need the nutrients. So we want to get these uh, nutrient inputs and outputs back into a reasonable point and get uh, so drained back down to a point where it's got the ability to hang on to these nutrients rather than lose it. So with that as a, a backdrop uh, of the, you know, really what we're, the challenge is to us today, th this slide shows um, the phosphate prices in, in the recent decades. Uh, we see this rather large spike here in about 2008 on into 2009, 2010. And uh, the phosphate price index here is, is one that's used of uh, 1982 being 100%. So you can see that in addition to phosphorus being a limited uh, nutrient worldwide, and again, um, Paul Fixon will develop that a bit more for you, we have uh, uh, one of our key nutrients has uh, actually increased quite a lot in, in price here in the last few years. And I, I know this summer when I was doing some pricing, I found phosphorus and fertilizer being priced at about $1.57 a pound. So it's quite an expensive nutrient for us uh, currently. So if we kind of take all these concepts and look at them in, in, the, in the context of this schematic, we've got, um, we're trying to improve nutrient balance at the whole farm level. And on the x-axis here, we have what we're looking at is increasing the adoption of management practices. And this could be feeding practices. It could be manure management storage and handling practices. It could be cropping and the types of crops we use and double and triple cropping. But what we're really trying to do as we look at the y-axis then, the vertical axis, we're trying to move any given farm from one of being in excess nutrients to one to being closer to being, you don't really want them in deficit. But we want to try to approach that, that nutrient balance point. And the solution for any given farm is going to be unique and different from, from other farms. So um, it can be a bit of a challenge to try to, um, to implement this overall approach and, and to reach that balance for a given farm. So, um, what we wanted to do as a part of this series is really show some technologies that are in place, in practice, on farms around the U.S. Uh, so that others could see what is happening on the farm. And so uh, for this month, uh, Paul Fixon uh, is going to give his global phosphorus perspective, and then Dana will be following up that, talking about some pea capture or phosphorus capture technology methods. Next month in December, Dana is going to give a perspective from, from Michigan in terms of uh, types of technology and um, approaches that are being taken there on dairy farms in the state. And then I'll talk about a uh, phosphorus capture technology from dairy manure that we have uh, been involved with for about the last six to eight years in, in Washington State. And then Craig Freer from our main campus is going to talk about a technology where they've um, been capturing nitrogen in the form of ammonium sulfate uh, from dairy manure. So next month we'll hear both uh, uh, nitrogen and a phosphorus uh, perspectives. Uh, January, Kurt Gooch from New York uh, will give a perspective on um, 
what's going on in that state and some of the challenges as it relates to trying to capture nutrients. Uh, Brian Paulson uh, will present uh, one of the talks related to nutrient capture from swine manure. And then uh, Dana Kirk and Sasha Rowling Scattergood um, from Michigan, again, will uh, talk about some ammonia stripping technology that's being evaluated there at a farm level um, in Michigan. So with that, uh, I think uh, we're ready to go ahead and move into our next speaker uh, for today. And uh, I'll hand you off to Paul Fixon and what should be a very enlightening uh, perspective on phosphorus at a global level.